Chapter Seven: The Hill. The heavy cruiser Chicago hung motionless in space, thousands of miles distant from the warring fleets of spaceships so viciously attacking and so stubbornly defending the planetoid of the enemy. In the captain's sanctum, Lyman Cleveland crouched tensely above his ultra cameras, his sensitive fingers touching lightly their micrometric dials. His body was rigid. His face was set and drawn. Only his eyes moved, flashing back and forth between the observation plates and smoothly running rolls which were feeding into the cameras the hardened steel tapes upon which were being magnetically recorded the frightful scenes of carnage and destruction there revealed. Silent and bitterly absorbed, though surrounded by staring officers, whose fervent, almost unconscious cursing was prayerful in its intensity, the Vizire expert kept his ultra-instruments upon that awful struggle to its dire conclusion. Flawlessly those instruments noted every detail of the destruction of Roger's fleet, of the transformation of the armada of Triplanetary into an unknown fluid, and finally of the dissolution of the gigantic planetoid itself. Then furiously Cleveland drove his beams against the crimsonly opaque obscurity into which the peculiar, viscous stream of substance was disappearing. Time after time he applied his every watt of power, with no result. A vast volume of space, roughly ellipsoidal in shape, was closed to him by forces entirely beyond his experience or comprehension. But suddenly, while his rays were still trying to pierce that impenetrable murk, it disappeared instantly, and without warning, the illimitable infinity of space once more lay revealed upon his plates, and his beams flashed on and on through the void unimpeded. "'Back to tell us, sir?' the Chicago's captain broke the strained silence. "'I wouldn't say so if I had the say.' Cleveland, baffled and frustrated, straightened up and shut off his cameras. We should report back as soon as possible, of course, but there seems to be a lot of wreckage out there yet that we can't photograph in detail at this distance. A close study of it might help us a lot in understanding what they did and how they did it. I'd say that we should get close-ups of whatever is left, and do it right away, before it gets scattered all over space, but of course I can't give you orders. You can, though, the captain made surprising answer. My orders are that you are in command of this vessel. In that case, we will proceed at full emergency acceleration to investigate the wreckage, Cleveland replied, and the cruiser, sole survivor of Triplanetary's supposedly invincible force, shot away with every projector delivering its maximum blast. As the scene of the disaster was approached, there was revealed upon the plates a confused mass of debris, a mass whose individual units were apparently moving at random, yet which was, as a whole, still following the orbit of Roger's planetoid. Space was full of machine parts, structural members, furniture, flotsam of all kinds, and everywhere were the bodies of men. Some were encased in spacesuits, and it was to these that the rescuers turned first. Space-hardened veterans, though the men of the Chicago were, they did not care even to look at the others. Strangely enough, however, not one of the floating figures spoke or moved, and space-line men were hurriedly sent out to investigate. "'All dead!' Quickly the dread report came back. "'Been dead a long time. The armor's all stripped off the suits, and the generators and the other apparatus are all shot. Something funny about it, too. None of them seem to have been touched, but the machinery of the suits seemed to be about half of it missing.' "'I've got it all on the spool, sir,' Cleveland, his close-up survey of the wreckage finished, turned to the captain. "'What they've just reported checks up with what I've photographed everywhere. I've got an idea of what might have happened, but it's so dizzy that I'll have to have a lot of reinforcement before I'll believe it myself. But you might have them bring in a few of the armored bodies, a couple of those switchboards and panels floating around out there, and half a dozen miscellaneous pieces of junk.' the nearest things they can get hold of, whatever they happen to be. Then back to Tellus at maximum? Right, back to Tellus, as fast as we can possibly go there. While the Chicago hurtled through space at full power, Cleveland and the ranking officers of the vessel grouped themselves about the salvaged wreckage. 
Familiar with space wrecks as were they all, none of them had ever seen anything like the material before them. For every part and instrument was weirdly and meaninglessly disintegrated. There were no breaks, no marks of violence, and yet nothing was intact. Bolt holes stared empty, cores, shielding cases and needles had disappeared, the vital parts of every instrument hung awry, disorganization reigned rampant and supreme. "'I never imagined such a mess,' the captain said, after a long and silent study of the objects. "'If you have any theory to cover that, Cleveland, I would like to hear it.' "'I want you to notice something first, the Viziray expert replied. "'But don't look for what's there. Look for what isn't there.' "'Well, the armor's gone. So are the shielding cases, shafts, spindles, the housings, and stems.' The captain's voice died away as his eyes raced over the collection. "'Why, everything that was made of wood, bakelite, copper aluminum, silver, bronze, or anything but steel hasn't been touched, and every bit of steel is gone. But that doesn't make sense. What does it mean?' "'I don't know yet,' Cleveland replied slowly. "'But I'm afraid that there's more, and worse.' He opened a space-suit, reverently, revealing the face. A face calm and peaceful, but utterly, sickeningly white. Still reverently, he made a deep incision in the brawny neck, severing the jugular vein, then went on soberly. "'You never imagined such a thing as white blood, either, but it all checks up. Some way, somehow, every particle—' probably every atom, of free or combined iron in this whole volume of space was made off with. Huh? How come? And above all, why? From the amazed and staring officers. You know as much as I do, grimly, ponderingly. If it were not for the fact that there are solid asteroids of iron out beyond Mars, I would say that somebody wanted iron badly enough to wipe out the fleets and the planetoid to get it. But anyway, whoever they were, they carried enough power so that our armament didn't bother them at all. They simply took the metal they wanted and went away with it, so fast that I couldn't trace them with an ultra-beam. There's only one thing plain, and that's so plain that it scares me stiff. This whole affair spells intelligence with a capital I, and that intelligence is anything but friendly. As for me, I want to get Fred Routabush at work on this soon— think I'll hurry it up a little. He stepped over to his ultra-projector and called the terrestrial headquarters of the TSS. Sam's face soon appeared upon his screen. "'We got it all, Virgil,' he reported. "'It's something extraordinary, bigger, wider, and deeper than any of us dreamed. It may be urgent, too, so I think I had better shoot the pictures in on the ultra-wave and save a few days.' Fred has a telemagneto recorder there that he can synchronize with this camera outfit easily enough, right? Right. Good work, Lyman. Thanks. Came back terse approval and appreciation, and soon the steel tapes were again flashing between the feed rolls. This time, however, their varying magnetic charges were modulating an ultrawave, so that every detail of that calamitous battle of the void was being screened and recorded in the innermost private laboratory of the Triplanetary Secret Service. Eager though he naturally was to join his fellow scientists, Cleveland did not waste his time during the long but uneventful journey back to Earth. There was much to study, many improvements to be made in his comparatively crude first ultra-camera. Then, too, there were long conferences with Sams, and particularly with Routabush, the mathematical physicist, whose was the task of solving the riddles of the energies and weapons of the Nevians. Thus it did not seem long before Green Terra grew large beneath the flying sphere of the Chicago. "'Going to have to circle at once, aren't you?' Cleveland asked the chief pilot. He had been watching that officer closely for minutes, admiring the delicacy and precision with which the great vessel was being manoeuvred preliminary to entering the Earth's atmosphere. "'Yes,' the pilot replied. We had to come in with the shortest possible time, and that meant a velocity here that we can't check without a spiral. However, even at that, we saved a lot of time. You can save quite a bit more, though, by having a rocket plane come out to meet us, 
somewhere around fifteen or twenty thousand kilometers, depending upon where you want to land. With their power-to-mass ratio, they can match our velocity and still make the drop direct. Guess I'll do that. Thanks. And the operative called his chief, only to learn that his suggestion had already been acted upon. We beat you to it, Lyman, Sam smiled. The Silver Sliver is out there now, looping to match your course, acceleration, and velocity at 22,000 kilometers. You'll be ready to transfer? I'll be ready. And the quartermaster's ex-clerk went to his quarters and packed his dunnage bag. In due time the long slender body of the rocket plane came into view, creeping down upon the spaceship from above, and Cleveland bade his friends good-bye. Donning a spacesuit, he stationed himself in the starboard airlock. Its atmosphere was withdrawn, the outer door opened, and he glanced across a bare hundred feet of space at the rocket plane which, keel ports fiercely aflame, was breaking her terrific speed to match the slower pace of the gigantic ship of war. Shaped like a toothpick, needle-pointed fore and aft, with ultra-stubby wings and vanes, with flush-set rocket ports everywhere, built of a lustrous silvery alloy of noble and almost infusible metals, such was the private speedboat of the chief of the TSS, the fastest thing known, whether in planetary air, the stratosphere, or the vacuous depth of interplanetary space, her first flashing trial spins had won her the nickname of the Silver Sliver. She had had a more formal name, but that title had long since been buried in the departmental files. Lower and slower dropped the Silver Sliver, her rockets flaming even brighter until her slender length lay level with the airlock door. Then her blasting discharges subsided to the power necessary to match exactly the Chicago's deceleration. "'Ready to cut, Chicago. Give me a three-second call,' snapped from the pilot room of the sliver. "'Ready to cut,' the pilot of the Chicago replied. "'Seconds. Three, two, one. Cut.' At the last word the power of both vessels was instantly cut off, and everything in them became weightless. In the tiny airlock of the slender craft crouched a space-line man with coiled cable in readiness, but he was not needed. As the flaring exhaust ceased, Cleveland swung out his heavy bag and stepped lightly off into space, and in a right line he floated directly into the open doorway of the rocket plane. The door clanged shut behind him, and in a matter of moments he stood in the control room of the racer, divested of his armor and shaking hands with his friend and co-laborer, Frederick Rodebush. "'Well, Fred, what do you know?' Cleveland asked, as soon as greetings had been exchanged. How do the various reports dovetail together? I know that you couldn't tell me anything on the wave, but there's no danger of eavesdroppers here. You can't tell, Rautabush soberly replied. We're just beginning to wake up to the fact that there are a lot of things we don't know anything about. Better wait until we're back at the hill. We have a full set of ultra screens around there now. There's a couple of other good reasons, too. It would be better for both of us to go over the whole thing with Virgil, from the ground up. And we can't do any more talking, anyway. Our orders are to get back there at maximum, and you know what that means aboard the sliver. Strap yourself solid in that shock absorber there, and here's a pair of earplugs. When the sliver really cuts loose, it means a rough party, all right. Cleveland assented, snapping about his body the heavy spring straps of his deeply cushioned seat but I'm just as anxious to get back to the hill as anybody can be to get me there. All set. Radebush waved his hand at the pilot, and the purring whisper of the exhaust changed instantly to a deafening, continuous explosion. The men were pressed deeply into their shock-absorbing chairs as the silver sliver spun around her longitudinal axis and darted away from the Chicago, with such a tremendous acceleration that the spherical warship seemed to be standing still in space. In due time the calculated midpoint was reached, the slim space plane rolled over again, and, mad acceleration now reversed, rushed on toward the earth, but with constantly diminishing speed. Finally a measurable atmospheric pressure was encountered, the needle prow dipped downward, and the silver sliver shot forward upon her tiny wings and vanes, nose rockets now drumming in staccato thunder. Her metal grew hot, dull red 
bright red, yellow, blinding white. But it neither melted nor burned. The pilot's calculations had been sound, and though the limiting point of safety of temperature was reached and steadily held, it was not exceeded. As the density of the air increased, so decreased the velocity of the man-made meteorite. So it was that a dazzling lance of fire sped high over Seattle, lower over Spokane, and hurled itself eastward, a furiously flaming arrow, slanting downward in a long, screaming dive toward the heart of the Rockies. As the now rapidly cooling greyhound of the skies passed over the western ranges of the bitter roots, it became apparent that her goal was a vast, flat-topped, and conical mountain, shrouded in livid light, a mountain whose height awed even its stupendous neighbors. While not artificial, the hill had been altered markedly by the triplanetary engineers who had built into it the headquarters of the Secret Service. Its mile-wide top was a jointless expanse of grey armor steel. The steep, smooth surface of the truncated cone was a continuation of the same immensely thick sheet of metal. No known vehicle could climb that smooth, hard, forbidding slope of steel. No known projectile could mar that armor. No known craft could even approach the hill without detection. Could not approach it at all, in fact, for it was constantly enclosed in a vast hemisphere of lambent violet flame through which neither material substance nor destructive ray could pass. As the silver sliver, crawling along at a bare three hundred miles an hour, approached that transparent, brilliantly violet wall of destruction, a violet light filled her control room and as suddenly went out, flashing on and off again and again. "'Giving us the once-over, eh?' Cleveland asked. That is something new, isn't it, Fred? Yes, it's a high-powered ultra-wave spy, Rodebush replied. The light is simply a warning, which can be carried if desired. It can also carry voice and vision. Like this, Sam's voice interrupted from the powerful dynamic speaker upon the pilot's panel, and his clear-cut face appeared upon the television screen. I don't suppose Fred thought to mention it, but this is one of his inventions of the last few days. We are just trying it out on you. It doesn't mean a thing, though, as far as the sliver is concerned. Come ahead. A circular opening appeared in the wall of force, an opening which disappeared as soon as the plane had darted through it, and at the same time her landing cradle rose into the air through a great trap-door. Slowly and gracefully, the space plane settled downward into that cushioned embrace. Then cradle and nestled sliver sank from view, and, turning smoothly upon mighty trunnions, the plug of armor drove solidly back into its place in the metal pavement of the mountain's lofty summit. The cradle elevator dropped rapidly, coming to rest many levels down in the heart of the hill, and Cleveland and Routabush leaped lightly out of their transport through her still hot outer walls. A door opened before them, and they found themselves in a large room of full daylight illumination, the anteroom of the private office of Virgil Sams. Chiefs of departments sat at their desks, concentrated upon problems or at ease, according to the demands of the moment. Televisit types and recorders flashed busily, but silently. Calmly efficient men and women went wantedly about the all-embracing business of Triplanetary's space-pervading secret service. "'Right away, Norma?' Rodebush paused briefly before the desk of the chief's private secretary, but even before he had spoken she had pressed a button, and the door behind her swung wide. "'You two do not need to be announced,' the attractive young woman smiled. "'Go right in.' Sams met them at the door eagerly, shaking hands particularly vigorously with Cleveland. "'Congratulations on the camera, Lyman!' he exclaimed. You did a wonderful piece of work on that. Help yourselves to smokes and sit down. There are a lot of things we want to talk over. Your pictures carried most of the story, but they would have left us pretty much at sea without Costigan's reports. But, as it was, Fred here and his crew worked out most of the answers from the dope the two of you got, and what few they haven't got yet, they soon will have. Nothing new on Conway? Cleveland was almost afraid to ask the question. No. A shadow came over Sam's face. I'm afraid, 
but I'm hoping it's only that those creatures, whatever they are, have taken him so far away that he can't reach us. They certainly are so far away that we can't reach them, Radebush volunteered. We can't even get their ultra-wave interference any more. Yes, that's a hopeful sign, Sams went on. I hate to think of Conway Costigan checking out. Their fellows was a real observer. He was the only man I have ever known who combined the two qualities of the perfect witness. He could actually see everything he looked at, and could report it truly to the last least detail. Take all this stuff, for instance, especially their ability to transform iron into a fluid allotrope, and in that form to use its intra-atomic energy as power. Something brand new, unheard of except in the ravings of imaginative fiction, and yet he described their converters and projectors so minutely that Fred was able to work out the underlying theory in three days, and to tie it in with our own supership. My first thought was that we'd have to rebuild it iron-free, but Fred showed me my error. You found it first yourself, of course. It wouldn't do any good to make the ship non-ferrous, unless you could so change our blood chemistry that we could get along without hemoglobin, and that would be quite a feat, Cleveland agreed. Then, too, our most vital electrical machinery is built around iron cores. No, we'll have to develop a screen for those forces. Screens, rather, so powerful that they can't drive anything through them. "'We've been working along these lines ever since you reported,' Rautabush said. "'And we're beginning to see light. And in that same connection it's no wonder that we couldn't handle our super-ship. We had some good ideas, but they were wrongly applied. However, things look quite promising now. We have that transformation of iron all worked out in theory— and as soon as we get a generator going, we can straighten out everything else in short order. And think what that unlimited power means. All the power we want. Power enough even to try out such hitherto purely theoretical possibilities as the neutralization of gravity, and even of the inertia of matter. "'Hold on,' protested Sams. "'You certainly can't do that. Inertia is—must be—' a basic attribute of matter, and surely cannot be done away with without destroying the matter itself. Don't start anything like that. Fred, I don't want to lose you and Lyman, too. Don't worry about us, Chief, Radabush replied with a smile. If you will tell me what matter is fundamentally, I may agree with you. No? Well, then, don't be surprised at anything that happens. We are going to do a lot of things that nobody ever thought of doing before. Thus for a long time the argument and discussion went on, to be interrupted by the voice of the secretary. "'Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Sams, but some things have come up that you will have to handle. Nobos is calling from out near Mars. He has caught the Endymion, and has killed about half her crew doing it. Milton has finally reported for Venus, after being out of touch for five days. He trailed the Wintons into Thaleron Swamp. They crashed him there, but he won out, and has what he went after. And just now I got a flash from Fletcher in the asteroid belt. I think that he has finally traced that dope line. But Nobos is on now. What do you want him to do about the Endymion? "'Tell him to—' "'No. Put him on here. I'd better tell him myself.' Sam's directed, and his face hardened in ruthless decision as the horny, misshapen face of the Martian lieutenant appeared upon the screen. "'What do you think, Nobos? Shall we come to trial or not?' "'No.' "'I don't think so, either. It is better that a few gangsters should disappear in space than run the risk of another uprising. See to it.' "'Right.' The screen darkened, and Sam spoke to his secretary. Put Milton and Fletcher on whenever their rays come in. He then turned to his guests. We've covered the ground quite thoroughly. Goodbye. I wish I could go with you, but I'll be pretty well tied up for the next week or two. Tied up doesn't half express it, Rodebush remarked as the two scientists walked along a corridor toward an elevator. He probably is the busiest man on the three planets. 
as well as the most powerful, Cleveland supplemented, and very few men could use his power as fairly. But he's welcome to it, as far as I'm concerned. I'd have the pink fantods for a month if I had to do only once what he's just done, and to him it's just part of a day's work. You mean the Endymion? What else could he do? <sighs> Nothing. That's just what I'm talking about. It had to be done, since bringing them to trial would probably mean killing half the people of Morsica. But at the same time, it's a ghastly thing to have to order a job of deliberate, cold-blooded, and illegal murder. You're right, of course, but you would— He broke off, unable to put his thoughts into words. For while inarticulate, manlike, concerning their deepest emotions, in both men was ingrained the code of their organization— both knew that to every man chosen for it, the service was everything, himself nothing. But enough of that. We'll have plenty of grief of our own right here. Rodebush changed the subject abruptly, as they stepped into a vast room, almost filled by the immense bulk of the Boise, the sinister spaceship which, although never flown, had already lined with black so many pages of Triplanetary's roster. She was now, however, the centre of a furious activity. Men swarmed over her and through her, in the orderly confusion of a fiercely driven but carefully planned programme of reconstruction. "'I hope your dope is right, Fred,' Cleveland called, as the two scientists separated to go to their respective laboratories. "'If it is, we'll make a perfect lady out of this unmanageable man-killer yet.'" CHAPTER Eight: THE SUPER-SHIP IS LAUNCHED after weeks of ceaseless work, during which was lavished upon her every resource of mind and material afforded by three planets, the Boise was ready for her maiden flight. As nearly ready, that is, as the thought and labor of man could make her. Rodebush and Cleveland had finished their last rigid inspection of the craft, and, standing beside the center door of the main airlock, were talking with their chief. "'You say that you think that it's safe, and yet you won't take a crew.' Sams argued. In that case it isn't safe enough for you men, either. We need you too badly to permit you to take such chances. You've got to let us go, because we are the only ones who are thoroughly familiar with her theory, Radebush insisted. I said, and still say, that I think it is safe. I can't prove it, however, except mathematically— because she's altogether too full of too many new and untried mechanisms, too many extrapolations beyond all existing or possible data. Theoretically, she is sound, but you know that theory can go only so far, and that mathematically negligible factors may become operative at those velocities. We do not need a crew for a short trip. We can take care of any minor mishaps, and if our fundamental theories are wrong— all the crews between here and Jupiter wouldn't do any good. Therefore we two are going alone. Well, be very careful anyway. Start out slow and take it easy. Start out slow? <laughs> we can't. We can't neutralize half of gravity, nor half of the inertia of matter. It's got to be everything or nothing, as soon as the neutralizers go on. We could start out on the projectors, of course, instead of on the neutralizers, but that wouldn't prove anything, and would only prolong the agony. Well, then, be as careful as you can. We'll do that, Chief, Cleveland put in. We think a lot of us, and we aren't committing suicide just yet if we can help it. And remember about everybody staying inside when we take off. It's barely possible that we'll take up a lot of room." Good-bye to all of you. Good-bye, fellows. The massive insulating doors were shut, the metal side of the mountain opened, and huge, squat caterpillar tractors came roaring and clanking into the room. Chains and cables were made fast, and, mighty steel rails groaning under the load, the spaceship upon her rolling ways was dragged out of the hill and far out upon the level floor of the surface before the tractors cast off and returned to the fortress. "'Everybody's under cover,' Sams informed Radabouche. 
The chief was staring intently into his plate, upon which was revealed the control room of the untried supership. He heard Radebush speak to Cleveland, heard the observer's brief reply, saw the navigator throw his switches. Then the communicator plate went blank. Not the ordinary blankness of a cut-off, but a peculiarly disquieting fading out into darkness. And where the great spaceship had rested, there was for an instant nothing. Exactly nothing. A vacuum. Vessel, false work, rollers, trucks, the enormous steel I-beams of the tracks, even the deep-set concrete piers and foundations in a vast hemisphere of the solid ground, all had disappeared utterly and instantaneously but almost as suddenly as it had been formed, the vacuum was filled by a cyclonic rush of air. There was a detonation as of a hundred vicious thunderclaps made one, and, through the howling, shrieking blasts of wind, there rained down upon the valley, plain and metalled mountain, a veritable avalanche of debris. Bent, twisted, and broken rails and beams, splintered timbers, masses of concrete, and thousands of cubic yards of soil and rock for inertia and gravitation had not been neutralized at precisely the same instant, and for a moment everything within the radius of action of the iron-driven gravity nullifiers of the Boise had continued its absolute motion with inertia unimpaired. Then, left behind immediately by the almost infinite velocity of the cruiser, all this material had again become subject to all of nature's everyday laws and had crashed back to the ground. "'Could you hold your beam, Randolph?' Samson's voice cut sharply through the days of stupefaction which held spellbound most of the denizens of the hill. But all were not so held. No conceivable emergency could take the attention of the chief ultrawave operator from his instruments. "'No, sir,' Radio Center shot back. "'It faded out, and I couldn't recover it. I put everything I've got behind a tracer on that beam—' but haven't been able to lift a single needle off the pin. And no wreckage of the vessel itself. Sams went on, half audibly. Either they have succeeded far beyond their wildest hopes, or else more probably. He fell silent and switched off the plate. Were his two friends, those intrepid scientists, alive and triumphant, or had they gone to lengthen the list of victims of that man-killing spaceship? Reason told him that they were gone. They must be gone, or else his ultra-beams, energies of such unthinkable velocity of propagation that man's most sensitive instruments had never been able even to estimate it, would have held the ship's transmitter in spite of any velocity attainable by any matter under any conceivable conditions. The ship must have been disintegrated as soon as Raudabush released his forces. And yet— had not the physicist dimly foreseen the possibility of such an actual velocity? Or had he? However, individuals could come and could go, but Triplanetary went on. Sams squared his shoulders unconsciously, and slowly, grimly, made his way back to his private office. He had scant time to mourn. Scarcely had he seated himself at his desk when an emergency call came snapping in a call of such import that his secretary's usually calm voice trembled as she put it on his plate. "'Commissioner Hinkle is calling, sir,' she announced. "'Something terrible is going on again out toward Orion. Here he is.' And there appeared upon the screen the face of the Commissioner of Public Safety, the commander of Triplanetary's every armed force, whether of land or of water, of air or of empty space." "'They've come back, Sams,' the Commissioner rapped out, without preliminary or greeting. Four vessels gone. A freighter and a passenger liner, with her escort of two heavy cruisers. All in Sector M. DX about 151. I have ordered all traffic out of space for the duration of the emergency, and since even our warships seem useless, every ship is making for the nearest dock at maximum.' How about that new flyer of yours? Got anything that will do us any good? No one beyond the hill's shielding screens knew that the Boise had already been launched. I don't know. We don't even know whether we have a super ship or not. 
and Sam's described briefly the beginning, and very probably the ending, of the trial flight, concluding, It looks bad, but if there was any possible way of handling her, Routabush and Cleveland did it. All our traces are negative yet, so nothing definite has— He broke off as a frantic call came in from the Pittsburgh station for the commissioner, a call which Sam's both heard and saw. "'The city is being attacked,' came the urgent message. "'We need all the reinforcements you can send us.' And a picture of the beleaguered city appeared in ghastly detail upon the screens of the observers, a view being recorded from the air. It required only seconds for the commissioner to order every available man and engine of war to the seat of conflict. Then, having done everything they could, Hinkle and Sam stared in helpless, fascinated horror into their plates, watching the scenes of carnage and destruction depicted there. The Nevian vessel, the sister ship, the craft which Costigan had seen in mid-space as it hurtled earthward in response to Nerado's summons, hung poised in full visibility high above the metropolis. Scornful of the pitiful weapons wielded by man, she hung there, her sinister beauty of line sharply defined against the cloudless sky. From her shining hull there reached down a tenuous but rigid rod of crimson energy, a rod which slowly swept hither and thither as the detectors of the amphibians searched out the richest deposits of the precious iron for which the inhuman visitors had come so far. Iron, once solid, now a viscous red liquid, was sluggishly flowing in an ever-thickening stream up that intangible crimson duct, and into the capacious storage tanks of the Nevian raider. And wherever that flaming beam went, there went also ruin, destruction, and death. Office buildings, skyscrapers towering majestically in their architectural symmetry and beauty, collapsed into heaps of debris as their steel skeletons were abstracted. Deep into the ground the beam bored, flood, fire, and explosion following in its wake as the mazes of underground piping disappeared. And the humanity of the buildings died, instantly and painlessly, never knowing what struck them, as the life-bearing iron of their bodies went to swell the Nevian stream. Pittsburgh's defences had been feeble indeed. A few antiquated railway rifles had hurled their shells upward in futile defiance, and had been quietly absorbed. The district plains of Triplanetary, newly armed with iron-driven ultra-beams, had assembled hurriedly and had attacked the invader in formation, but with little more success. Under the impact of their beams the strangers' screens had flared white, then poised ship and flying squadron alike had been lost to view in a murkily opaque shroud of crimson flame. The cloud had soon dissolved, and from the place where the planes had been had floated or crashed down a litter of non-ferrous wreckage. And now the cone of spaceships from the Buffalo base of Triplanetary was approaching Pittsburgh, hurling itself toward the Nevian plunderer and toward known, gruesome, and hopeless defeat. "'Stop them, Hinkle!' Sams cried. "'It's sheer slaughter. They haven't got a thing. They aren't even equipped yet with the iron drive.' "'I know it,' the commissioner groaned. "'And Admiral Barnes knows it as well as we do, but it can't be helped. Wait a minute. The Washington Cone is reporting. They're as close as the other, and they have the new armament. Philadelphia is close behind, and so is New York. Now perhaps we can do something.' The Buffalo Flotilla slowed and stopped, and in a matter of minutes the detachments from the other bases arrived. The cone was formed in iron-driven vessels in the van, the old-type craft far in the rear. It bore down upon the Nevian, vomiting from its hollow front a solid cylinder of annihilation. Once more the screens of the Nevian flared into brilliance, once more the red cloud of destruction was flung abroad. But these vessels were not entirely defenceless. Their iron-driven ultra-generators threw out screens of the Nevian's own formulae, screens of prodigious power to which the energies of the amphibians clung, and at which they clawed and tore in baffled, wildly coruscant displays of power unthinkable. For minutes the furious conflict raged, while the inconceivable energy being dissipated by those straining screens hurled itself in terribly destructive bolts of lightning upon the city far beneath. 
no battle of such incredible violence could long endure. Triplanetary's ships were already exerting their utmost power, while the Nevians, contemptuous of Solarian science, had not yet uncovered their full strength. Thus the last desperate effort of mankind was proved futile, as the invaders forced their beams deeper and deeper into the overloaded defensive screens of the war vessels, and one by one the supposedly invincible spaceships of humanity dropped in horribly dismembered wreckage upon the ruins of what had once been Pittsburgh. CHAPTER Nine, SPECIMENS Only too well founded was Costigan's conviction that the submarine of the deep-sea fishes had not been able to prevail against Narada's formidable engines of destruction. For days the Nevian lifeboat, with its three terrestrial passengers, hurtled through the interstellar void without incident but finally the operative's fears were realized. His far-flung detector screens reacted. Upon his observation plate lay revealed Nerado's mammoth spaceship, in full pursuit of its fleeing lifeboat. "'On your toes, folks! It won't be long now!' Costigan called, and Bradley and Cleo hurried into the tiny control room. Armor donned and tested, the three terrestrials stared into the observation plates, watching the rapidly enlarging pictures of the Nevian spaceship. Nerado had traced them and was following them, and such was the power of the great vessel that the nearly inconceivable velocity of the lifeboat was the veriest crawl in comparison to that of the pursuing cruiser. "'And we've hardly started to cover the distance back to Tellus. Of course you can't get in touch with anybody yet,' Bradley stated rather than asked. I kept on trying until they blanketed my wave, but all negative. Thousands of times too far for my transmitter. Our only hope of reaching anybody was the mighty slim chance that our super-ship might be prowling around out here already. But it isn't, of course. Here they are. Reaching out to the control panel, Costigan shot out against the great vessel wave after wave of lethal vibrations under whose fiercely clinging impacts the Nevian defensive screens flared white. But strangely enough, their own screens did not radiate. As if contemptuous of any weapons the lifeboat might wield, the mother ship simply defended herself from the attacking beams, in much the same fashion as a wildcat mother wards off the claws and teeth of her spitting, snarling kitten who is resenting a touch of needed maternal discipline. They probably won't fight us at that. Cleo first understood the situation. This is their own lifeboat, and they want us alive, you know. There's one more thing we can try. Hang on! Costigan snapped as he released his screens and threw all his power into one enormous presser beam. The three were thrown to the floor and held there by an awful weight, as if the lifeboat darted away at the stupendous acceleration of the beam's reaction against the unimaginable mass of the Nevian sky rover. But the flight was of short duration. Along that presser beam there crept a dull rod of energy, which surrounded the fugitive shell and brought it slowly to a halt. Furiously, then, Koskin set and reset his controls, launching his every driving force and his every weapon, but no beam could penetrate that red murk, and the lifeboat remained motionless in space. No? Not motionless. The red rod was shortening, drawing the truant craft back toward the launching port from which she had so hopefully emerged a few days before. Back and back it was drawn, Costigan's utmost efforts futile to affect by a hair's breadth its line of motion. Through the open port the boat slipped neatly, and as it came to a halt in its original position within the multilayered skin of the monster, the prisoners heard the heavy doors clang shut behind them, one after another. And then sheets of blue fire snapped and crackled all about the three suits of triplanetary armor. The two large human figures and the small one were outlined starkly in blinding blue flame. "'That's the first thing that has come off according to schedule.' Koskin laughed a short, fierce bark. <laughs> "'That is their paralyzing ray. We've got it stopped cold.' and we've each got enough iron to hold it forever. "'But it looks as though the best we can do is to stalemate,' Bradley argued. "'Even if they can't paralyze us, we can't hurt them, 
and we are heading back for Nevia. I think Narada will come in for a conference, and we'll be able to make terms of some kind. He must know what these Lewistons will do, and he knows that we'll get a chance to use them, some way or other, before he gets to us again. Koskin asserted confidently, but again he was wrong. The door opened, and through it there waddled, rolled, or crawled, a metal-clad monstrosity, a thing with wheels, legs, and writhing tentacles of jointed bronze, a thing possessed of defensive screens sufficiently powerful to absorb the full blast of the triplanetary projectors without effort. Three brazen tentacles reached out through the ravening beams of the Lewistons, smashed them to bits, and wrapped themselves in unbreakable shackles about the armored forms of the three human beings. Through the door the machine or creature carried its helpless load, and out into and along a main corridor, and soon the three terrestrials, without armor, without arms, and almost without clothing, were standing in the control room, again facing the calm and unmoved Nerado. To the surprise of the impetuous Costigan, the Nevian commander was entirely without rancor. "'The desire for freedom is perhaps common to all forms of animate life,' he commented through the transformer. "'As I told you before, however, you are specimens to be studied by the College of Science, and you shall be so studied in spite of anything you may do. Resign yourselves to that.' Well, say that we don't try to make any more trouble, that we cooperate in the examination and give you whatever information we can, Costigan suggested. Then you will probably be willing to give us a ship and let us go back to our own world? You will not be allowed to cause any more trouble, the amphibian declared coldly. Your cooperation will not be required. We will take from you whatever knowledge and information we wish. In all probability you will never be allowed to return to your own system, because as specimens you are too unique to lose. But enough of this idle chatter. Take them back to their quarters. And back to their intercommunicating rooms the prisoners were led under heavy guard. True to his word, Narado made certain that they had no more opportunities to escape. All the way back to far-distant Nevia the spaceship sped, where at once, in manacles, the terrestrials were taken to the College of Science, there to undergo the physical and psychical examinations which Nerado had promised them. Cleo and Costigan learned that the Nevian scientist captain had not erred in stating that their cooperation was neither needed nor desired. Furious but impotent, the human beings were studied in laboratory after laboratory by the coldly analytical, unfeeling scientists of Nevia, to whom they were nothing more nor less than specimens, and in full measure they came to know what it meant to play the part of an unknown, lowly organism in a biological research. They were photographed, externally and internally. Every bone, muscle, organ, vessel, and nerve was studied and charted. Every reflex and reaction was noted and discussed. Meters registered every impulse, and recorders filmed every thought, every idea, and every sensation. Endlessly, day after day, the nerve-wracking torture went on, until the frantic subjects could bear no more. White-faced and shaking, Cleo finally screamed wildly, hysterically, as she was being strapped down upon a laboratory bench and at the sound Costigan's nerves, already at the breaking point, gave way in an outburst of berserk fury. The man's struggles and the girl's shrieks were all like futile, but the surprised Nevians, after a consultation, decided to give the specimens a vacation. To that end they were installed, together with their earthly belongings, in a three-roomed structure of transparent metal, floating in the large central lagoon of the city. There they were left undisturbed for a time. Undisturbed, that is, except by the continuous gaze of the crowd of hundreds of amphibians which constantly surrounded the floating cottage. First we're bugs under a microscope, Bradley growled. Then we're goldfish in a bowl. I don't know that— He broke off as two of their jailers entered the room. 
Without a word into the transformers, they seized Bradley and the girl. As those tentacular arms stretched out toward Cleo, Costigan leaped. A vain attempt. In mid-air the paralyzing ray of the Nevians touched him, and he crashed heavily to the crystal floor. And from that floor he looked on in helpless, raging fury, while his sweetheart and his captain were carried out of their prison and into a waiting submarine. Chapter 10 the Boise Axe. But what of the supership? What happened after that inertialess, that terribly destructive take-off? Dr. Frederick Raudabush sat at the control panel of Triplanetary's newly reconstructed spaceship, his hands grasping the gleaming ebonite handles of two double-throw switches. Facing the unknown though the physicist was, yet he grimmed whimsically at his friend. Something, whatever it is, is about to take place. The Boise is taking off, under full neutralization. Ready for anything to happen, Cleve? All ready. Shoot. Laconically, Cleveland also was constitutionally unable to voice his deeper sentiments in time of stress. Radabush flipped the switches clear over in flashing arcs and instantly over both men there came a sensation akin to a tremendously intensified vertigo, but a vertigo as far beyond the space-sickness of weightlessness as that horrible sensation is beyond mere terrestrial dizziness. The pilot tried to reverse the switches he had just thrown, but his leaden hands utterly refused to obey the dictates of his reeling mind. His brain was a writhing convulsive mass of torment indescribable, expanding, exploding, swelling out with an unendurable pressure against its confining skull. Fiery spirals, laced with streaming, darting lances of black and green, flamed inside his bursting eyeballs. The universe spun and whirled in mad gyrations about him as he reeled drunkenly to his feet, staggering and sprawling. He fell. He realized that he was falling, yet he could not fall. Thrashing wildly, grotesquely, in agony, he struggled madly and blindly across the room, directly toward the thick steel wall. The tip of one hair of his unruly thatch touched the wall, and the slim length of that single hair did not even bend, as its slight strength brought to an instant halt the hundred and eighty-odd pounds of mass, mass now entirely without inertia, that was his body. But finally the sheer brain-power of the man began to triumph over his physical torture. By indomitable force of will he compelled his groping hands to seize a lifeline, almost meaningless to his dazed intelligence, and through that nightmare incarnate of hellish torture he fought his way back to the control board. Hooking one leg around a standard, he made a seemingly enormous effort and drove the two switches back into their original positions then fell flat upon the floor, weakly but in a wave of relief and thankfulness, as his racked body felt again the wanted phenomena of weight and of inertia. White, trembling, frankly and openly sick, the two men stared at each other in half-amazed joy. "'It worked!' Cleveland smiled wanly as he recovered sufficiently to speak, then leaped to his feet. "'Snap it up, Fred!' We must be falling fast. We'll be wrecked when we hit. We're not falling anywhere. Raudabush, foreboding in his eyes, walked over to the main observation plate and scanned the heavens. However, it's not as bad as I was afraid it might be. I can still recognize a few of the constellations, even though they are all pretty badly distorted. That means that we can't be more than a couple of light-years or so away from the solar system. Of course, since we had so little thrust on, practically all of our time and energy was spent in getting out of the atmosphere. But even at that, it's a good thing that space isn't an absolutely perfect vacuum, or we would have been clear out of the universe by this time. Huh? Impossible. Where are we, anyway? Then we must be making mi— Oh, I see. Cleveland exclaimed in disjointed sentences as he also stared into the plate. "'Right. We aren't travelling at all, now,' Radabush replied. "'We are perfectly stationary relative to Tellus, since we made the hop without inertia. 
We must have attained one hundred percent neutralization, which we didn't quite expect, and therefore we must have stopped instantaneously when our inertia was restored. But it isn't where we are that is worrying me the most. We can fix our place in space accurately enough by a few observations. It's when. That's right, too. Say we're two light-years away. You think maybe we're two years older than we were ten minutes ago, then? That's possible, of course, maybe probable. There's been a lot of discussion on that theory. Now's a good time to prove or to disprove it. Let's snap back to tell us and find out. We'll do that, after a little more experimenting. You see, I had no intention of giving us such a long push. I was going to throw the switches over and back, but you know what happened. However, there's one good thing about it. It's worth two years of anybody's life to settle that relativity time thing definitely, one way or the other. I'll say it is. But say, we've got a lot of power on our ultra-wave. Enough to reach Telus, I think. Let's locate the sun and get in touch with Sam's. Let's work on these controls a little first, so we'll have something to report. Out here's a fine place to try the ship out. Nothing in the way. All right with me, but I would like to find out whether I'm two years older than I think I am, or not. Then for hours they put the great supership through her paces, just as test pilots check up on every detail of performance of an airplane of new and radical design. They found that the horrible vertigo could be endured, perhaps in time even conquered as space sickness could be conquered, by a strong will and a sound body, and that their new conveyance had possibilities of which even Routabush had never dreamed. Finally, their most pressing questions answered, they turned their most powerful ultra-beam communicator toward the yellowish star which they knew to be Old Soul. Sam's. Sam's. Cleveland spoke slowly and distinctly. Routabush and Cleveland reporting from the space-eating Wampus, now directly in line with Beta Ursae Minoris from the Sun. Distance, about 2.2 light-years. It will take six banks of tubes on your tightest beam, LSV-3, to reach us. Barring a touch of an unusually severe type of space sickness, everything worked beautifully even better than our calculations showed. There's something we want to know right away. Have we been gone four hours and some odd minutes, or better than two years? He shut off the power, turned around a bush, and went on. Nobody knows how fast this ultra-wave travels, but if it goes as fast as we did coming out, it's certainly moving. I'll give him about thirty minutes, then shoot in another call. But in less than two minutes the care-ravaged face of their chief appeared sharp and clear upon their plates, and his voice snapped curtly from the speaker. "'Thank God you're alive, and twice that the ship works!' he exclaimed. "'You've been gone four hours, eleven minutes, and forty-one seconds. But never mind about abstract theorizing. Get back here, to Pittsburgh, as fast as you can drive. That Nevian vessel, or another like her, is mopping up the city, and has destroyed half the fleet already. "'We'll be back in nine minutes,' Rodebus snapped into the transmitter. Two to get from here to atmosphere, four from atmosphere down to the hill, and three to cool off. Notify the full four-shift crew, everybody we've picked out. Don't need anybody else. Ship, batteries, and armament are ready.' Two minutes to atmosphere, and it took ten coming out? Think you can do it? Cleveland asked, as Radebush flipped off the power and leaped to the control panel. We can do it in a few seconds if we had to. We use scarcely any power at all coming out, and I'm not using very much going back. The physicist explained rapidly, as he set the dials which would determine their flashing course. The master switches were thrown, and the pangs of inertialessness again assailed them, but weaker far this time than ever before, and upon their lookout plates they beheld a spectacle never before seen by eye of man. For the ultra-beam, with its heterodyned vision, is not distorted by any velocity yet attained, 
as are the ether-borne rays of light. Converted into light only at the plate, it showed their progress as truly as though they had been travelling at a pace to be expressed in the ordinary terms of miles per hour. The yellow star that was the sun detached itself from the firmament, and leaped toward them, swelling visibly, momentarily, into a blinding monster of incandescence, and toward them also flung the earth, enlarging with such indescribable rapidity that Cleveland protested involuntarily, in spite of his knowledge of the peculiar mechanism of the vessel in which they were. "'Hold it, Fred, hold it! Way enough!' he exclaimed. "'I'm using only ten thousand dines, so she'll stop herself as soon as we touch atmosphere, long before she can even begin to heat,' Rodebush explained. "'Looks bad, but we'll stop without a jar.' And they did. Weightless and without inertia, gravitation powerless against her neutralizing generators, the great supership came from her practically infinite velocity to an almost instantaneous halt in the outermost, most tenuous layer of the Earth's atmosphere. Her halt was but momentary. Inertia restored, and gravitation allowed again to affect her mass, she dropped at a sharp angle downward. More than dropped, she was forced downward by one full battery of projectors, projectors driven by iron-powered generators. Soon they were over the hill, whose violet screens went down at a word. Flaming a dazzling white from the friction of the atmosphere through which she had torn her way, the Boise slowed abruptly as she neared the ground, plunging toward the surface of the small but deep artificial lake below the hill's steel apron. Into the cold waters the spaceship dove, and even before they could close over her, furious geysers of steam and boiling water erupted as the stubborn alloy gave up its heat to the cooling liquid. Endlessly the three necessary minutes dragged their slow way into time, and finally the water ceased boiling, and Routabush tore the ship from the lake and hurled her into the gaping doorway of her lock. The massive doors of the airlocks opened, and while the full crew of picked men hurried aboard with their personal equipment, Sams talked earnestly to the two scientists in the control room. "'And about half the fleet is still in the air. They aren't attacking. They are just trying to keep her from doing much more damage until you can get there. How about your take-off? We can't launch you again. The tracks are gone. But you handled her easily through coming in?' That was all my fault, Radabush admitted. I should have neutralized inertia first, but I had no idea that the fields would extend beyond the hull, nor that they wouldn't act simultaneously. We'll bring her out on the projectors this time, though, the same as we brought her in. She handles like a bicycle. The projector blast tears things up a little, but nothing serious. Have you got that Pittsburgh beam for me yet? We're about ready to go. "'Here it is, Dr. Radabush, came the secretary's voice, and upon the screen there flashed into being the view of the events transpiring above that doomed city. "'The dock is empty and sealed against your blast.' And thereupon, "'Good-bye, and power to your tubes,' came Sam's ringing voice. As the words were being spoken, mighty blasts of power raved from the driving projectors, and the immense mass of the super-ship, shot out from the portals and upward into the stratosphere. Through the tenuous atmosphere the huge ship rushed with ever-mounting speed, and while the hope of Triplanetary drove eastward, Raudabush studied the ever-changing scene of battle upon his plate, and issued detailed instructions to the highly trained specialists manning every offensive and defensive weapon. But the Nevians did not wait to join battle until the newcomers arrived. Their detectors were sensitive operative over untold thousands of miles, and the ultra-screen of the hill had already been noted by the invaders as the Earth's only possible source of trouble. Thus the departure of the Boise had not gone unnoticed, and the fact that, not even with his most penetrant rays could he see into her interior, had already given the Nevian commander some slight concern. Therefore, as soon as it was determined that the great ship was directed towards Pittsburgh, the fish-shaped cruiser of the void went into action. High in the stratosphere, speeding eastward, 
the immense mass of the Boise slowed abruptly, although no projector had slackened its effort. Cleveland, eyes upon interferometer grading and spectrophotometer charts, fingers flying over calculator keys, grinned as he turned toward Raudebush. "'Just as you thought, Skipper. An ultra-band pusher. C4-V63-L29. Shall I give him a little pull?' "'Not yet. Let's feel him out a little before we force a close-up. We've got plenty of mass. See what he does when I put full push on the projectors.' As the full power of the terrestrial vessel was applied, the Nevian was forced backward, away from the threatened city, against the full drive of her every projector. Soon, however, the advance was again checked, and both scientists read the reason upon their plates. The enemy had put down reinforcing rods of tremendous power. Three compression members spread out fanwise behind her, bracing her against the low mountain side, while one huge tractor beam was thrust directly downward, holding in an unbreakable grip a cylinder of earth extending deep down into bedrock. Two can play at that game. And Raudebush drove down similar beams and forward-reaching tractors as well. "'Strap yourselves in solid, everybody,' he sounded a general warning. "'Something is going to give way somewhere soon, and when it does, we'll get a jolt.' and the promised jolt did indeed come soon. Prodigiously massive and powerful as the Nevian was, the Boise was even more massive and more powerful, and as the already enormous energy feeding their tractors, pushers, and projectors was raised to its inconceivable maximum, the vessel of the enemy was hurled upward, backward, and that of earth shot ahead with a bounding leap that threatened to strain even her mighty members. The Nevian anchor rods had not broken. They had simply pulled up the vast cylinders of solid rock that had formed their anchorages. "'Grab him now!' Raudebush yelled, and even while an avalanche of falling rock was burying the countryside, Cleveland snapped a tractor ray upon the flying fish and pulled tentatively. Nor did the Nevian now seem averse to coming to grips. The two warring super-dreadnoughts darted toward each other, and from the evader there flooded out the dreadful crimson opacity which had heretofore meant the doom of all things Solarian. It flooded out and engulfed the immense mass of humanity's hope in its spreading cloud of redly impenetrable murk. But not for long. Triplanetary's supership boasted no ordinary terrestrial defense, but was sheathed in screen after screen of ultra-vibrations, imponderable walls, it is true, but barriers impenetrable to any unfriendly wave. To the outer screen the red veil of the Nevians clung tenaciously, licking greedily at every square inch of the shielding sphere of force, but unable to find an opening through which to feed upon the steel of the Boise's armor. "'Get back! Way back! Go back and help Pittsburgh!' Rodebush drove an ultra-communicator beam through the murk, to the instruments of the terrestrial admiral. For the surviving warships of the fleet, its most powerful units, were hurling themselves forward to plunge into that red destruction. None of you will last a second in this red field. And watch out for a violet field pretty soon. It'll be worse than this. We can handle them alone, I think. But if we can't, there's nothing in the system that can help us and now the hitherto passive screen of the supership became active. At first invisible, it began to glow in livid violet light, and as the glow brightened to unbearable intensity, the entire spherical shield began to increase in size. Driven outward from the supership as a center, its advancing surface of seething energy consumed the crimson murk as a billow of blast-furnace heat consumes a cloud of snowflakes in the air above its shaft. Nor was the red death-mist all that was consumed. Between that ravening surface and the armor skin of the Boise there was nothing. No debris, no atmosphere, no vapor, no single atom of material substance, the first time in terrestrial experience that an absolute vacuum had ever been attained. Stubbornly contesting every foot of way lost, the Nevian fog retreated before the violet sphere of nothingness. Back and back it fell, 
disappearing altogether from all space as the violet tide engulfed the enemy vessel, but the flying fish did not disappear. Her triple screens flashed into furiously incandescent splendor, and she entered, unscathed, that vacuous sphere, which collapsed instantly into an enormously elongated ellipsoid, at each focus a madly warring ship of space. Then in that tube of vacuum was waged a spectacular duel of ultra-weapons, weapons impotent in air but deadly in empty space. Beams, rays, and rods of titanic power smote cracklingly against ultra-screens equally capable. Time after time each contestant ran the gamut of the spectrum with his every available ultra-force, only to find all channels closed. For minutes the terrible struggle went on. Then— "'Cooper! Adlington! Spencer! Dutton!' Rodebush called into his transmitter. "'Ready? Can't touch him on the ultra, so I'm going into the macro-bands. Give him everything you have as soon as I collapse the violet. Go!' At the word, the violet barrier went down, and with a crash as of a disrupting universe, the atmosphere rushed into the void and through the hurricane there shot out the deadliest material weapons of triplanetary. Torpedoes, non-ferrous, ultra-screened, beam-dirigible torpedoes charged were the most effective forms of material destruction known to man. Cooper hurled his canisters of penetrating gas, Adlington his atomic iron explosive bombs, Spencer his indestructible armor-piercing projectiles, and Dutton, his shatterable flasks of the quintessence of corrosion, a sticky, tacky liquid of such dire potency that only one rare solarian element could contain it. Ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred were thrown as fast as automatic machinery could launch them, and the Nevians found themselves adversaries not to be despised. Size for size, their screens were quite as capable as those of the Boise. The Nevians' destructive rays glanced harmlessly from their shields, and the Nevians' elaborate screens, neutralized at impact by those of the torpedoes, were impotent to impede their progress. Each projectile must needs be caught and crushed individually by beams of the most prodigious power, and while one was being annihilated, dozens more were rushing to the attack. Then, while the twisting, dodging invader was busiest with the tiny but relentless destroyers, Rodebush launched his heaviest weapon. The macrobeams, prodigious streamers of bluish-green flame which tore savagely through course after course of Nevian screen. Malevolent fangs, driven with such power and velocity that they were biting into the very walls of the enemy vessel, before the amphibians knew their defensive shells of force had been punctured. And the emergency screens of the invaders were equally futile course after course was sent out, only to flare viciously through the spectrum, and to go black. Outfought at every turn, the now frantically dodging Nevian leaped away in headlong flight, only to be brought to a staggering, crashing halt, as Cleveland nailed her with a tractor beam. But the terrestrials were to learn that the Nevians held in reserve a means of retreat. The tractor snapped, sheared off squarely, by a sizzling plane of force, and the fish-shaped cruiser faded from Cleveland's sight, just as the Boise had disappeared from the communicator plates of Radio Center, back in the hill, when she was launched. But though the plates in the control room could not hold the Nevian, she did not vanish beyond the ken of Randolph, now communications officer in the supership, for, warned and humiliated by his losing one speeding vessel from his plates in Radio Center, he was now ready for any emergency. Therefore, as the Nevian fled, Randolph's spy-ray held her, automatically behind it as there was the full output of twelve special banks of iron-driven power tubes, and thus it was that the vengeful terrestrials flashed immediately along the Nevian's line of flight. Inertialess now, pausing briefly from time to time to enable the crew to accustom themselves to the new sensations, the Boise pursued the invader, hurtling through the void with a velocity unthinkable. "'He was easier to take than I thought he would be,' Cleveland grunted, staring into the plate. "'I thought he had more stuff, too,' Radabush assented. 
but I guess Costigan got almost everything they had. If so, with all their own stuff and most of theirs besides, we should be able to take them. They must have neutralization, too, to take off like that, and if it's one hundred percent we'll never catch them. But if it isn't... But it isn't. There they are. And this time I'm going to hold her or burn out all our generators trying, Cleveland declared grimly. Are you fellows down there able to handle yourselves yet? Fine. Start throwing out your cans. Space-hardened veterans all, the other terrestrial officers had fought off the horrible nausea of inertialessness, just as Raudabush and Cleveland had done. Again the ravening green macro-beams tore at the flying cruiser. Again the mighty frames of the two spaceships shuddered sickeningly as Cleveland clamped on his tractor rod. Again the highly dirigible torpedoes dashed out with their freights of death and destruction. And again the Nevian shear-plane of force slashed at the terrestrial's tractor beam. But this time the mighty puller did not give in to the solid rod of energy. Brighter, thicker, and longer grew the discharges as the gnawing plane drew more and more power. But in general ratio to that power the rod grew larger, denser, and ever harder to cut. More and more vivid came the pyrotechnic energy of electric brilliance, until suddenly the entire tractor rod disappeared. At the same instant a blast of intolerable flame erupted from the Boise's flank, and the whole enormous fabric of her shook and quivered under the force of a terrific detonation. "'Randolph, I don't see them. Are they attacking or running?' Raudibus demanded. He was the first to realize what had happened. "'Running! Fast!' "'Just as well, perhaps, but get their line. Adlington! Here?' "'Good. Was afraid you were gone. That was one of your bombs, wasn't it?' Yes, well launched, just inside the screens. Don't see how it could have detonated, unless something hot and hard struck it in the tube. It would need about that much time to explode. Good thing it didn't go off any sooner, or none of us would have been here. As it is, Area 6 is pretty well done in, but the bulkheads held the damage to 6. What happened? We don't know yet exactly. Both generators on the tractor beam went out. At first I thought that was all, but my neutralizers are dead, and I don't know what else. When the G-4s went out, the fusion must have shorted the neutralizers. They would make a mess. It must have burned a hole down into number six tube. Cleveland and I will come down, and we'll all look around. Donning spacesuits, the scientists let themselves into the damaged compartment through the emergency airlocks, and what a sight they saw. Both outer and inner walls of alloy armor had been blown away by the awful force of the explosion. Jagged plates hung awry, bent, twisted, and broken. The great torpedo tube, with all its intricate automatic machinery, had been driven violently backward, and lay piled in hideous confusion against the backing bulkheads. Practically nothing remained whole in the entire compartment. "'Nothing much we can do here,' Raudabush said finally through his transmitter. Let's go see what number four generator room looks like. That room, though not affected by the explosion from without, had been quite as effectively wrecked from within. It was still stiflingly hot. Its air was still reeking with the stench of burning lubricant, insulation, and metal. Its floor was half covered by a semi-molten mass of what had once been vital machinery. For with the burning out of the generator bars, the energy of the disintegrating allotropic iron had had no outlet, and had built up until it had broken through its insulation, and in an irresistible flood of power, had torn through all obstacles in its path of neutralization. Hmm. Should have had an automatic shut-off. One detail we overlooked, Raudabush mused. The electricians can rebuild this stuff here, though. That hole in the hull is something else again. I'll say it's something else, the grizzled chief engineer agreed. She's lost all her spherical strength. Anchoring a tractor with this ship now would turn her inside out. Back to the nearest triplanetary shop for us, I would say. Come again, chief, 
Cleveland advised the engineer. None of us would live long enough to get there. We can't travel inertialess unless the repairs are made. So if they can't be made without very much traveling, it's just too bad. I don't see how we could support our jacks. The engineer paused, then went on. If you can't give me Mars or Tellus, how about some other planet? I don't care about atmosphere or about anything but mass. I can stiffen her up in three or four days if I can sit down on something heavy enough to hold our jacks and presses. But if we have to rig up space cradles around the ship herself, it'll take a long time. Months, probably. Haven't got a spare planet on hand, have you? We might have at that, Radebush made a surprising answer. A couple of seconds before we engaged, we were heading toward a sun with at least two planets. I was just getting ready to dodge them when we cut the neutralizers, so they should be fairly close somewhere. Yes, there's the sun right over there. Rather pale and small, but it's close, comparatively speaking. We'll go back up into the control room and find out about the planets. The strange sun was found to have three large and easily located children, and observations showed that the crippled spaceship could reach the nearest of these in about five days. Power was therefore fed to the driving projectors, and every scientist, electrician, and mechanic bent to the task of repairing the ruined generators, rebuilding them to handle any load which the converters could possibly put upon them. For two days the Boise drove on. Then her acceleration was reversed, and finally a landing was effected upon the forbidding, rocky soil of the strange world. It was larger than the earth, and of a somewhat stronger gravitation. Although its climate was bitterly cold, even in its short daytime, it supported a luxuriant but outlandish vegetation. Its atmosphere, while rich enough in oxygen and not really poisonous, was so rank with indescribably fetid vapors as to be scarcely breathable. But these things bothered the engineers not at all. Paying no attention to temperatures or to scenery, and without waiting for chemical analysis of the air, the space-suited mechanics leaped to their tasks, and in only a little more time than had been mentioned by the chief engineer, the hull and giant frame of the supership were as staunch as of yore. "'All right, skipper,' came finally the welcome word. "'You might try her out with a fast hop around this world before you shove off in earnest.' Under the fierce blast of her projectors, the vessel leaped ahead, and time after time, as Raudabush hurled her mass upon tractor beam or presser, the engineers sought in vain for any sign of weakness. The strange planet half girdled, and the severest test passed flawlessly. Raudabush reached for his neutralizer switches, reached and paused, dumbfounded, for a brilliant purple life had sprung into being upon his panel, and a bell rang out insistently. "'Want the blue blazes!' Radabush shot out an exploring beam along the detector line, and gasped. He stared, mouth open, then yelled, "'Roger is here, rebuilding his planetoid! Stations all!' 